welcome to another episode of Fully Charged. This week, coming from a rather nondescript series of warehouses just outside Stroud in Gloucestershire, there's a flag with an E and a spark on it. I wonder what it's all about. Oh, look at that. That's nice. Oh, I don't know what that is. What's this? So this is going to be possibly the world's first high-performance, high-powered, pure electric sport race aircraft. Right. Uh, a technology demonstrated to show what high-powered, electric uh, propulsion can do for aerospace. Right. Yeah. Um, so this, is, uh, this isn't an actual flying plane, this is what we're no. standing for. This is a full-size engineering model. Right. So um, wind the clock back a bit, about five and a half, six years ago, um, I've been keeping an eye on what's been happening uh, in the electric motor and battery uh, world. And also um, model airplane people have been using electric motors uh, propulsion for years and years, a long time. And it was just starting to become viable, the, the power density of batteries, because obviously with aircraft, weight is quite critical. And also the, the architecture of electric motors that was starting to be made, um, thinking, hmm, actually, you know, they could be adapted for, for aerospace. Um, prior to this, I, I got involved with Red Bull Air Racing in as much as doing some performance enhancement work and was privileged to go to quite a few races around the world. And, and the time through the track, the average time through the racetrack of Red Bull Air Race uh, is about 90 seconds. Wow. I know, a light bulb yeah. went on. Yes. I thought, well, hang on a minute. If we did a technology demonstrator, that can stay in the air for five or ten minutes. Yeah and show what can be done with, with uh, high-powered electric, you know, it'd be quite game-changing. Right. And looking at the automobile industry, um, where you put uh, electric propulsion in a car, you get zero emissions, zero noise pretty much, and a huge amount of torque. You put that in an aeroplane and you get more. You right. get all three things. But the fact that electric motors aren't attitude sensitive, so aerobatics and you know, that kind right. of stuff, they're not prone to shock cooling. Um, so a lot of these aircraft, hydrocarbon engines, they get quite hot. And if you want to come down quickly, overcooling can crack, the, you know, wow. cause a lot of problems. Right. And also, electric motors don't require oxygen. Yes. So you can go to a far higher altitude. Yeah. Um, and also, as you're gaining altitude, you don't have to keep adjusting the mixture control if it's a hydrocarbon engine. Because the battery oh. technology is changing quickly. I mean, it's not only the power density of the batteries, but also the ability to charge them. Because right. I remember when I bought my first battery drill oh, 20 years ago, um, it would take eight hours overnight to charge up, and then the next morning you get about three minutes. Yes, of, you know, it's like oh drill man, three holes, you know, and three it. holes, yeah. and, and uh, you know that's it. But now the time to charge a battery is pretty much the same as the time to discharge it. Right. Yeah, I mean, presumably, then, the actual capacity of the batteries you've got in here, in, t in comparison with a, uh, a road-going car, is fairly small, because you, yes. you need a lot of power for a very, very short yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. What's really exciting is the architecture of electric motors allow us to do this contra-rotating system. Right. So I did notice, there's t so these, these turn... The in opposite direction, turn in opposite. so they'll, oh, they'll go that way. Wow. So briefly then explain why you would want that because that makes absolutely to, to someone who doesn't understand anything yeah. about aeronautics that makes no sense it sounds like it's going to be chopping the air up and causing yeah. all sorts of problems. so if you go back to the second world war uh, as the war progressed um, the engines were getting more and more powerful and to absorb that power the propellers got bigger and bigger and if you give an example overlay the side profile of a mark one spitfire over the last mark which i think it was a 22 the mark 22's got a longer fuselage and a bigger fin to accommodate a more powerful engine with a bigger propeller. Right. And you have to raise the undercarriage. And, and then towards the end of the war, some bright sparks thought, well, hang on a minute. If we put a gearbox on the front of our Merlin or Griffin engine and we drive two propellers, we can reduce the diameter, but right. still get, get the, the power. power absorbed and yeah. the thrust. The other thing it does um, is it counteracts the torque effect. Because if you can imagine you're turning Huge one big propeller, um, pilots had to be very careful. You couldn't open the throttle quickly on a Spitfire or high-powered fighter. You had to feed the power in slowly until you got speed and you had uh, rudder authority, aerodynamic so, so you authority. Needed, you needed air going over the rudder yes, before to, you got any yes. steerage. Otherwise, right. if you just went whack like that, it, it, would, just, it would just spin yeah, around. Yeah, right. you'd be facing the hanger right. or the hedge or something. Yeah. So yes, it counteracted the torque. So effectively, you could go right. whack like that. So they could take off straight. faster, yes. effectively. So the Not reason like for doing this then is to, because you're, getting, you're basically getting far more pull from yes. these two. If yeah. you just had one electric motor and one bigger propeller, yeah. you'd have less 
Well, if we had one motor uh, with one propeller, the propeller would be a larger diameter. Right. This aeroplane would have to be a lot have bigger, be, be bigger, raised right. undercarriage, longer. And it, right. it's, just, it's just the fact that we can do this contra-rotating system that allows us to put this huge amount of power in this small airframe. At the moment, um, the calculated figures coming out with the airframe and the, the motor and the propeller uh, design um, is coming out at just over 300 miles an hour. Right. For this size, this will be up there with the hydrocarbon racing airplane. So uh, it's certainly that. on a par then. It's not like oh, yes. the petrol ones yeah. do 500 miles an hour and you might get to 300. It's you're, yeah. you're, you're absolutely neck and neck with that. So, yeah. so yeah. for this size, because yeah. when you see a little you know, two-seater Piper going over the house, that's doing 100 miles an hour probably. Yeah. I mean, they're not going that yeah. fast. Yeah. So this is quick in comparison this to This will that. be quick. If I'm parked on the end of a runway with a, a modern frontline fighter, whether it's a typhoon or a tornado, and we both hit the start button at the same time, I think we'd be somewhere around about 20,000 feet and climbing before they caught up. They soon leave us behind. Right. But it's the fact that with electric, it's instant. It's instant, yeah. You know, you, you don't, you know, with a jet, modern jet aircraft, it takes about two and a half minutes to scramble because they've got to wind and spool up the engine, yeah. they've got to get the hydraulics and the core temperature and everything. And once that's all, then they can go. But electric, it's just, just instant. I've come off the back of um, working in the automotive industry for the last sort of five or six years, specialising in um, hybrid and electric powertrains. Um, so I've been really lucky to sort of see the industry through the boom year. So back when I started, when I was sort of 18, straight out of school, I worked for an electric motor company. And there we were building our own prototype cars and electric cars were a very new concept. Um, and since then, I've worked for a couple other companies, like McLaren and Jaguar Land Rover, and now we see cars like the Tesla on the road, and it's fantastic to see how quickly it's all progressed. Um, and in that time, I was sort of working um, at becoming an aerobatic pilot, and that's something I do now. Right. And I've always had a passion for aviation, and I've been looking at this amazing technology um, that I work in my day job, and then right. I'd go and fly behind a 50-year-old yes. internal combustion engine, and it just didn't seem, it just didn't seem very natural. So, yeah. Is this another mock-up of the, of the um, plane you're This developing? is a little bit different to the other one. So the other one's designed to obviously look good, it shows the concept, right. whereas this is actually what we call our space frame allocation. Right. Um, model. So what it enables us to do is take our concept and work out where we're actually going to put the components. Right. So where we're going to put our motors and our batteries and stuff like that. So we'll just take the uh, what would be sort of the engine cover off. Right. Yeah, oh, so, so is that more than one? Yeah, That'll precisely. Be, right. so, oh, so what we have here is a mock-up of right. uh, two electric motors that we were looking at using. Right. They're bolted together um, and you can see they're nice. It's a nice small compact. It's tiny, isn't it? it, it, it it's, it's sort of lawnmower engine size, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, precisely. Really? Yeah, so, um, for some weight comparisons, this whole unit is going to weigh somewhere in the region of between 50, 55 kilograms. Right. Whereas the equivalent, for the equivalent power in terms of internal combustion, um, you're looking at 150 to 200 kilograms. So wow. it's, yeah, so it's like an order of magnitude difference. Right. Um, and it's that lightweight power plant that enables this whole concept to work really right. well. So you can see straight away behind this, we've got a nice space to put our batteries. So that's what the batteries that go here as well. Of course, yeah, I was yeah, thinking oh, they'll be down the back, but you don't want a heavy well, back on an Precisely, airplane, yeah. So <laughs> our centre of gravity is all quite critical yeah. in an aeroplane. As I said, coming off the back of working in automotive, I've seen the technology mature really well. Yeah. So I, like, I understand that we don't actually need to reinvent the wheel here because yeah. at the moment, all of the technology we're using currently exists within the automotive world. Right. And we're just repurposing it and putting it in a crazy airframe. And right. we're going to try and yeah, break some records. Go crazy fast. Yeah, crazy fast, yeah. <laughs> So Steve, now I'm hearing that you're going to be the first person that will fly this aircraft once it's made. Yeah, I mean I've got a, a sort of history of sort of high performance little aeroplanes, sporting aeroplanes, right. racing and aerobatics. Um, and that's really what attracted me to this. Um, it looks like a fairly conventional high performance light aeroplane. But when they told me that it could have 300 horsepower in the front. Right. And a little tiny thing like this. That's what really got my, got my interest. Yes. Amazing, amazing. Because I, I have no idea, where, for instance, the, the, the Red Bull aerobatic plane I went in with Nigel, what, I don't know what horsepower that had. I haven't got a clue. Well, it, it seemed very powerful and fast. Yeah, and indeed it would have been. It's about 300 horsepower in those aeroplanes. Oh, so that is what 300 horsepower does in a plane. Oh, my 
Lord. Now but, I understand, because it's very hard to judge, you know, what, what that would actually mean. That is terrifying. Indeed, but if you think that that airplane you went in had you and Nigel yes. and quite a big airframe and still performed very well, yeah. this is just one person in the smallest possible airplane. Yeah. Should go like hell. Right. Oh, goodness me. So this is the, we're looking at the, the, the cockpit, which presumably is relatively similar to, to a, a racing plane anyway. I mean, it's a, the, the, presumably the actual air surface controls, that's the same, that, that, that's not different. No, that's right. It's a, it's a relatively conventional airplane. It's all, be it made in completely carbon fiber, so very right. light, very strong. Um, but yeah, the cockpit is conventional. Um, the only difference is really are we have two throttles because we're running two, two motors at the front right. and two big off buttons because it's right. a, still a test airplane, so we might need the, the big off, off buttons. Off. Yeah. And the, the other thing which is, is certainly unique to a little racing airplane is this um, red handle here, which um, if it's pulled, activates what's called the ballistic recovery system, which is big rocket in the back here, wow. fires out of there with a parachute, which brings the whole airplane down on a parachute. Wow. So if something goes really wrong, you don't have to get out and use your own parachute. No. The plane's got a parachute. Because that's the good thing about this is it's been tested in larger aircraft in the States, but right. it's never been fitted to a little airplane like this. Um, because, of course, if you do like the RAF style thing or the military thing of bailing out of your airplane, you don't know where it's going to go. Right. So it's a then unmanned airplane, you know, it could yeah. hurt somebody. Yeah. So this, the idea of this is that you pull that, the whole thing comes down at a rate that the, the pilot and the aircraft survive, right. and it comes down at a slow speed and pretty much directly where you, below right. where you start right. from. You know, so. so if you're right underneath it, you've got time to go, oh look, let's get, you can get out of the way. way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. While we were visiting Electroflight, we couldn't resist having a look at how they make the propellers. These are made in a workshop next door run by a different company, but they make beautiful propellers, mostly for old classic planes. But in this case, they're making them for the Electroflight. Now you'd think, with a modern plane like this, with electric motors and batteries and the latest technology, they'd make them out of carbon fibre or 3D printed titanium alloy powder. But no, they make them out of wood. Lots of bits of wood glued together and then turned on a CNC machine that's completely computer controlled and really, really cool, and then they spray them. They're made of wood. We've got a good advantage that in many ways the, the model making world is perhaps several steps ahead of us. Right. And we've actually got one model here, which is a lovely, lovely illustration. We have one propeller going around that way, right. difficult to show, and the other propeller going the other way. Wow. This is what we mean by contra-rotating. Why we're so excited with the possibilities of electric motors is we can take uh, two small very high power electric motors, and we can actually back to back them. So you can see in this arrangement, we've oh, got So that two is motors. two motors there, right. That's right, and we've got what we call shaft within shaft. So the, the back motor is actually driving the, the front propeller, right. and vice versa, then the front motor is pr driving the back propeller. Right, so these are, this is a, a test bed, but one's gonna go one way, one's gonna go the other, and then you can move them together and see what happens. That, that's exactly right. Oh. Um, and I'll do that in a second, but just to explain the, the idea of the design, yeah. the, the first thing you've just said, uh, we, we keep this one fixed, right. but we can move them in and out. Right. So you see in that position, it's beginning to look more like the model. More like that, yeah. Um, but is that the best position? We don't know. Right. Should they be perhaps there right. or there? Yeah. So it's the sort of thing we can experiment with. Um, but uh, we've also got each motor mounted on these little blue units here. Um, lovely bit of engineering in that they show us how much power the motors are drawing. Right. The, the volts and the amps. But also, this part is what we call a load cell. It's actually measuring how much how thrust. Much, ah, right. Um, and by having them on in individual load cells, we can measure the, the, um, the thrust of each right, motor right. and then see what the combined effect right. is. Okay, well, the first thing we do, Robert, is these uh, are very high power. So right. you've obviously got some glasses. I've got some eye protection. That's good. I'll put these on if I just to be on the safe side. Okay, so we're now ready to go, Robert. Right. And so if, I'll just ask you to stand a little bit back. Oh, okay. Yep. We'll start this motor first. Right. So you come over here. Oh, my goodness. I sort of expected it to be, you know, the dessert. That's incredible. And that's, you barely turned it up, so it's... That, that's right, so that's, wow. that's now running. And we start the other one. Undo the locking nuts, and very gently... 
we, we can bring them up. The back propeller's pushing the We're air pushing this, the this way. This is sucking. And this is actually quite a low power setting. Right. So if I lock that down there, yeah. which simulates full contratating, if you'd like to come and stand behind okay. me, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll put one power up first. Oh, sorry, because <laughs> it was actually blowing the propellers. But because it's a little, mod, you know, I'm thinking model aeroplanes, and a little bit of foof, and it would fly a little plane. That is, for the scale of it, what's coming off that is ridiculous. So, and it also, you could, I could really feel when you turned the first one up, I felt an increase. But when you turned the, the second one up, then it was really intense. So that, you that's could right. really feel a doubling of the power coming out of it. But it's a lovely idea, and yeah. electric, really takes it forward where it was it was um, slightly parked with the development of the jet engine right and this is why partly why we're so excited about it yeah. but that is enough what you then feel is that then the the, the, the notion of a, a larger airplane that doesn't necessarily have the performance of this but has the power to get a fairly heavy machine off the ground I would I would believe that you know a couple of those on the wings and you've got an enormous amount of thrust from that. You? Well, <clears throat> again, you're absolutely right, but even take it a stage further, um, one of the exciting things for the, the big boy developers is they're saying we can radically rethink the shape of large aircraft. Right. And to, your example just there, putting them on the wings, um, at the moment, there's a lot of aircraft perhaps taking up to 20 passengers. They've got one propeller on each wing, two engines. Yeah. We could combine them into one contratating unit on the nose. You then clean the wings, right. and you make you get a more efficient airframe. Right. So it, it's, you you constantly get these extra yes. benefits yeah. at, at every turn. Yeah.